Welcome back to Nicolin's Comic Corner Classic Classic Noon Classics. This is episode number 2145, double shot number 2039. Both the two trades feature characters that were introduced by Stan Lee back in the 60s. The first one was a collection coming back in the early 2000s. The other one was a fairly recent trade. First story we have is Fantastic Four Heroes Return, the complete collection, book four. Yep, unknown if it's going to be a volume 5 or not. That that part, I do not know if there is going to be one. Given the fact that the very next issue comes right after this one is to start a Mark Way's three-year run of the book. Yes, three years. Start issue 60, wrapped up, I think, with issue... was either 524 or 527. I don't remember where it ended up. I know it started issue 60. This book collects issues 46 to 59 of Fantastic Four of Volume 3. The 2001 which was the last day of published... For seven years. No joke. That series is like that. And the thing in She-Hulk. Uh, Long Night. Uh, let me just make sure about that. To see how correct about that little assumption there. Because I want to be wrong. Because I do not want to be accused. Of basically where like. Oh Fantastic Four. Okay, so the well, after annual two thousand one, the next day to come out until wasn't that one? No, because I remember there was one or annual besides that one. I think after 27, I think there was the, uh, oh, I think I know, maybe it's, uh, ah, here we go.
So I think, um, so basically after that, the next hand was released until, I could have sworn it was earlier than that, but apparently no. So the next hand was not released for nine years. Yes, nine years. So this book starts out with that 2001 annual. Yes. Which makes the first of these, uh, these uh, Calibri collections I've seen. Where they start off with an annual. Which that's where the story basically starts off with. Where these. This is. It's a start, by the way the writers of these issues are. Carlo Pacchio. Raphael Morin. Jeff Loeb. Carl Kitzler. Aaron Warren. Uh, excuse me. Adam Warren. Tom DeDico. Fabian DeCiza. Udon's Ken Sing Chung. Chung. Uh, our work is done by Kevin McGuire, Jeff Johnson, Carl Pacchio, Tom Gummett, Mark Bagley, Stuart Emming, Ke- uh, Kieran Grant, Brian Hitch, uh, Leno Francis Hugh, Stephen Rude, uh, Udon's Alvin Lee, and, and Ivy Reyes. Interesting. Uh, the front cover here is done by this is Ariel, uh, Ariel Arlovti. This back cover here, that's done by Mark uh, Mike Wendigo, Carl Kitzler, Paul Mautz, Carlos Pacchio, Jesus Mario, and C. Pacchio. Yeah, that's does his back cover here. Mostly put this annual starts off a, a storyline that goes on from 46 to 49, where this is basically the first the start of it. It continues to 46 to 49. It mostly was a lot of old reality stuff, but it's Fantastic Four. What do you expect? It's a very good story. And the story does officially wrap up with issue number 49. Yes, that's where Storyline Felicity wraps up. Uh, 50 is mostly... By the way, the main villain of Storyline is called Abraxas. He's like Ultra Reality, and that's what the plot of this storyline is. It was Ultra Reality stuff. We also see with Eternity here, which is always nice to see Eternity. He's got Shattered. 50 is part of the Nuff Said stuff. If you're curious, still about the Nuff Said, that is... Something else altogether. Oh, and here's a little fun fact for you about this annual, this particular issue 50. This is the last time we ever would see an issue 54 published for Fantastic Four because I thought that the most recent volume by Dan Slott basically would do that, but no. This is the second and last ever issue 50 we ever see because. Marvel hit the restart button for the Fantastic Four book recently. Uh, enough says basically like any issue, like any major issue, like double such came out this particular month. You have Black Panther 39, Iron Man 49. This is, of course is Black Panther Volume 3, Iron Man Volume 3, Captain Marvel Volume 4, 26. This issue, uh, 49, Fingers Volume 3, uh, the final issue of the Fingers Volume 2, Electra Volume Number 6, Cable 100. Uh, Captain Market Volume 3, Issue 50, which was the final issue of that volume. Uh, Daredevil Volume 228, Deadpool 61, which I believe that volume lasted for 8 more issues for hitting the reset button. X Number 7, Incredible Hulk 35, New X-Men Number 121, uh, Peter Parker Spider-Man Number 38, this actually was Volume 230. This book actually lasted for surprisingly, uh, 20 more issues before the book ended. Uh, Punisher Volume 6, Issue 7, though I think it's more like Volume 5, Issue 7. Spider Girl 41, Thor Volume 2, uh, number 44, and that book lasted for 40 more issues before ending. No, seriously, 40 more issues. Uh, Thunderbolts 59, and that book before it kind of briefly ended, that managed to last for a shocking 22 more issues before ending. Uh, Uncanny X 401, Wolverine 170, uh, Volume 2 171, that book managed to last for 18 more issues after that before it got restarted. X Force managed to left for shocking six more issues after this issue. Issue X Men, uh, I think it was like 40 issues. This one, so a little while we just started. And you have Amazing Experiment Volume 2, number 39. Yeah, this book, uh, this book will last for another, I believe, if I remember correctly, almost, I think it was like 28 issues. No, it was, it was basically, this one was also the book was. 18 more issues before this book got retitled to be issue, just to basically uh, issue 500. Yeah, 50 is mostly just a, like anniversary issue. We have we have even uh, Johnny Storm put on his uh, outfit here. 
Also, it's really interesting 50 that Sue Richards is pregnant again. Uh, fun fact, this actually is the third time she's been pregnant. Now, you're probably thinking, Nick, has she pregnant before? I mean, yeah, Franklin was the first child. That's been established since the 60s. Uh, she actually did have miscarriage back in the 70s. And I guess that probably the writer of the book probably felt as though, yeah, probably a good time for her to have another child. There's also jokes about, oh, pulling pranks to a torch and, of course, uh, the thing. There's various stuff going on here. We also have Johnny Swim cast as Rawhide Kid. Yeah, this is a plot thread that barely goes anywhere at all. And he gets replaced uh, toward the end of the issues in here with a, a guy who can duplicate himself as Johnny Storm. So basically, he was fired from the thing would not be in there. This time he goes out saving the world. And Doctor Doom, he is mostly here just to... He's basically a tease for the very next story arc, basically. Yeah. Yeah, very different artists working this issue, which, good stuff here. And, love it. Uh, 51 begins a four-part story arc where it involves Fantastic Four. Uh, this also, this is kind of strange, though. This book didn't collect these issues for some reason, but these the issues worked like before. In a Fantastic Four slash Inhumans trade, which collected the fourth volume, uh, I think it was the third volume for Inhumans. It was a four issue mini series that was collected in a previous Fantastic Four trade, but was not collecting this one for some reason. I don't know why, it's weird. Uh, mostly put, it's basically, well, Reed and Sue just doing, like, going, trying to, of course, Reed trying to protect his wife, who's pregnant for the third time. And we have also the Shapeshifter. Who poses as Johnny Storm. Yeah, that comes to play later. Oh, by the way, the artwork in these issues are done by um, Mark Bagley. Yeah, this is Mark Bagley's artwork. Yeah, he takes over the artist for several issues. We have stuff with the guardsmen here. Basically, the humans are trying to go public. And people are misconsuming these people are alien invaders. Doctor Who, who is like usually like the world... Con they're trying the... the, the, the uh, Basically, a guy who tries to conquer the world because that's what he wants to do. Along to the Fantastic Four. Even he agrees, basically, that the whole thing with the humans being alien invaders and people's misconceptions about them is utter bullcrap. Which is strange. And, of course, that comes basically a good, good role here. And so, Doctor Doom basically just also openly admits, basically, he's, he's welcome to have their own family in his country, no problem. And the thing is, no one dared mess with Doctor Doom because they know whenever he shows up, he means business. Despite the fact when Marvel writes him, he usually is the punch bag for the entire Marvel Universe. Yep, that's a recurring joke about the guy. So, and of course, Reed goes to labor, uh, Sue goes to labor, and it turns into the whole entire thing is forced by this weird one from Johnny Storm's past. I think, uh, because it's from him from his past and and of course the way this is written it's it's kind of like similarly what we see in the X-Men books published this period of time you know people don't like mutants because they're different uh there's some bigotry here so apparently they're trying to experiment with something basically people weren't big against in humans uh this surprisingly only is in this storyline here because after this any other time the humans show up after this one they, they're not really true that way into after Infinity, where it's written that way, where he would like in humans either, just like he like mutants. And then, of course, basically, this turns out this alien. I thought she was from Giant Spider. Nope, she just called the human ones. And so, Doctor Doom volunteers to help, uh, basically, Sue with the birthing, and she gives birth to baby girl, which uh, she makes an agreement with Doctor Doom. Uh, ask him for his help for helping her with this birth in exchange he gets named the baby and Reed's like what? really? and he was thinking nah he was thinking Dora first like call her Valerie yep and he walks off yeah and here's the thing despite the fact that he basically named Reed and Sue's baby Reed has no problem with the name it's never brought up after this. He has an issue with Doctor Doom. He does, at first, basically, like, yeah, yeah he's like, your, your graduate is Owen Richards. By receiving some extra satisfaction from naming the girl, no, you, 
Yes, he will, Rita agrees with. He, she agreed because Susan at least knows. I'm a man honor and style. I'm going to crass name her a child as Duma, for instance. No, she should be called Valeria. I place you under real protection, little Valeria. Any your foolish that strike at you, they will deal with me. Yeah, and basically kind of in a way, Doc then becomes Valerie's godfather. And she calls him, when she gets like a little bit older, when she's like three or four, she calls him Uncle Victor. Yeah, that's something James Robinson basically explores in his book. Yeah. So, after this sort of wraps up, nice little bow. Then we have the last two issues in here. Well, first we have basically a standalone issue, which is just, oh, an evening out. Yeah, 55 was mostly just a standalone issue. Ish, apparently, see like a version of the Apostle Map here, here. Then we have Janet basically just uh, spoiling uh, v Valeria, which is so nice, the fact they threw her in here. Oh, by the way, you might be curious, though, is she, is she with anybody at this point in time? Uh, I think at this time point, she was kind of trying to resume a relationship with Hank Pym. Yeah, so... Last few issues, mostly, just, like, mostly standalone issues. Like, you have thing remember in the past. It's mostly a thing issue, as most with 57 is. 56? 57! It just basically... Where... He ends up in another match to fights other versions of himself. Yep, that's mostly put what these last few issues are. Basically just deals with Ben Grimm. And then, of course, right after basically that solo wraps up, then we have the Long Night One Shot. Yep, which is done by... Uh, the artwork is done by Brian Hitch. But the um, the writing here is done by Todd DeZigo. Yep. It's a one shot. Yep, a one shot. Um, with uh, Paul Narni, this, this one shot's got four different artists on it. Yeah, Brian Hitch, Paul Narni, Ivor Reyes, and Randy Ebelum. Yep. And you can tell it's Brian Hitch's artwork because of the way he does. I, I do appreciate his, his 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 style as an artist. It's just I'm not really a big fan of his writing. Yeah, I've never been a big fan of his writing. Most of it just basically a night out with, with well, The Thing and uh, She-Hulk. Which, by the way, no, these two never came a couple in the comics. Nope. Despite what people, some people might, might think about these two, they're just really good friends, of course. But they basically just have a lot of fun with this night. And that's it. This book is surprisingly really good. Yep. The Spike came out a period of time. I think it was from, like, a period about 01 to about, I'd say about 03. Two wish I think it is. Uh, just a really good book. A good book, roughly a 9.5 out of 10. Uh, let me take us on first. We're going to the next book here. Alright, so next up it is Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3 Hobgoblin. No, I didn't buy this one like the first two volumes. Uh, mainly because I knew the library's going to pick this one up really soon, so I figured, why not just give him library? Uh, this book collects issues 9 to 14, Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, I believe this is Volume 6. Yep, <sighs> Volume 6. Uh, mostly put basically... These issues are kind of building up to... Now, there is a standalone issue here. Issue 10 will get... Uh, basically, so here's what happens issues. Of course, everything here is there by Zeb Wells. Our work, for the most part, is done by uh, Patrick Gleason, who does issues 9 to 13. Uh, 14 is done by four different artists, which is done by Michael Downing, Kyle Holtz, Terry and Rachel Dodson, and um, Ryan Segman does the last one. He's, he, he, he's the uh, artist of that one with Tim Townsend. So issue nine is mostly put basically 
Uh, the issue where it deals with the Hellfire Gala. Yep. Spider-Man was actually invited to help our Gela for the, for this storyline here. So he's given... By the way, despite the fact he's wearing that costume cover, he's not wearing the costume at the... at the Hellfire our Gela. Nope. Uh, and also... Now, I had heard... This is something basically has been uh, suggested online for quite a while before uh, I came across this issue again. Where apparently more McTaggart murdered Mary Jane Watts and skinned her wearing her as a skin... That's not the case here. She apparently put the vice around her neck so that Peter won't get near her, otherwise Del Moro Tackle will strangle her. Yeah, that's what happened here. There's no Mormon Tiger skinny buddy. Yeah, that was a rumor going on for quite a while that Mormon Tiger might do this, but nope. Completely untrue. Yep, so she goes off and So, by the end of the issue, thing is removed, and it just basically just a one-off standalone tie-in issue with uh, the second half of Argella. That's mostly put what this issue is. Peter and MJ basically just walk off. She walks off, basically doesn't want to deal with it right now. And then issue 10. 10 is quite interesting because it's a tie-in to Avengers X-Men Eternals Judgment Day. Where, the way it's written, nobody cares about Spider-Man. But the Celestials do. So they judge him. Yes, they judge him. In this issue. Where it's like, oh, basically like... Or people just don't care. And then Peter, well... Is visited by, apparently... Gwen Stacy. But it's actually a Celestial disguise. Of course, Randy is like... Don't you see anyone? No, nothing's there. He said, pack up ducks for the wedding. You want out today? He's like, Randy, what about Celeste judging the entire planet? Yeah, Janice doesn't really believe in all that. She thinks it's... She she, she does believe in murdering me if you don't find out ducks. I'm sorry, I really, I really did. You kidding me? You promised. I did promise. I should say. Yeah, pick out a tux. And of course, well, have picks of the tux. Go subway with, with... Um, so, basically, the Celeste was known as Gwen, but also... Ben Parker! Yep, so then Jameson basically is here to cheer him up, and he, he has a day with Miles, apparently to take on the Rocket Racer. Yes, apparently Rocket Racer is going to back to be a criminal for some random reason, despite the fact he's been reformed for years. Yeah, I thought that was kind of weird. And then, of course, about this issue, he's being judged. Uh, there's also appearance by Norman Osborn, and apparently he's gene as worthy. And... As a reward, he briefly talks to Gwen Stacy. She disappears. And then this Gwen Stacy talks to Norman Osborn. And that's the issue. Uh, the rest of the issues are mostly put the whole storyline with the Hobgoblin. Yes. Where it... By the way, uh, first two issues do not have Jarmy and Jude in the artwork. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, wait, but I thought you were all 13. Nope. Gleason did issue 9, Tens of a Nick Dura. John Mia Jr. does issues 11 and 13. 11 and 13 is a three parter where it deals with the Hobgoblin. And I agree with a lot of people when they ask this question. Why the heck would John Mia Jr. brought back this book? Honestly, there's no reason for it because after this quick store wraps up, he's gone for the book for quite some time. He actually just recently came back to the book and been gone for several issues. Yeah. So. Ned is posing as Hobgoblin again. Yes, Ned Lass, who's brought back in Clone Conspiracy. So, okay, if you're curious, though, Zeb Wills had nothing to do with the revival of Ned Lads. That was all Dan Slott. Dan Slott did that. Blame him for that, not Zeb Wills. Zeb Wills has nothing to do with the storyline. Zeb Wills is just following up something that Dan Slott established. So, so Betty and the revived Ned have a kid together. And his name is Watson. So, oh, by the way, for some reason, I do not know why Zeb Wells is this for. Apparently, Camilla Khan is a supporting character in Amazing Spider-Man. You're probably thinking, what? Why the heck would a character who has had a series of ongoing series since 2013, who lasted a miniseries prior to this one, is now a supporting character in Amazing Spider-Man? Why? 
I have no idea. It is... Though the way she's drawn here is kind of weird. Because Kamala Khan is supposed to be a teenager. I'd say around 15, 16 years old. Here she looks a little older. She looks like in her 20s. And yes, this is Kamala Khan. A.K.A. Miss Marvel. And she's basically Peter's lab partner. Then she goes with M. He goes with Black Cat. We kind of ask her like... Got confidence in you. And he talks to Ned. And then we have, well... So, this outfit here, uh, if you're curious, if you saw the miniseries recently, uh, this is kind of the debut of the Gold Goblin suit. Yes, it's called Gold Goblin because Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin. It's been established for some time he was Green Goblin. Gold Goblin is more heroic version of basically him as a hero. And this will lead to a brief miniseries for him. I mean, this looks really good. They actually had two issues in this book tie into a cross I'll talk about. So, this all thing in here, Roger Kingsley is demanding that no one else born return his assets to him, his empire. Like, basically kind of coerce him. And no one else arrives. Paperwork is like, here you go. You want to come back? Fine. It's yours. I don't care. Don't give a damn. Yeah, basically, no one else bought his, buy his company. And according to Osborne, he did it legally. Kingsley thought he did it basically via illegal maneuvers because, well, no one else was associated with legal stuff over the years. So that's what he thought, and he rightfully would assume that. But nope, he just handed it over, and that was that. More fight, and then of course we have this. And then we have, for some reason, another Hobgoblin. Yeah, this is Ned Ladd's. Yep, they confirm this actually is Ned Ladd's. Yeah, apparently Ned Ladd's gone insane. So Osborne's in jail. Then later on, he basically... Uh... So basically, Peter visits uh, Betty. And this whole thing with Ned here. And, well, he fights a version of the Hobgoblin. And eventually, like, call the police to help out his employee, a.k.a. Spider-Man. And it's like, Kingsley, what? You, you can't be surprised. But you were just with Osborne. What, you were just with Osborne. Osborne. I was. Yep, and yeah, it's kind of weird. And then we have two hobgoblins. What? Yeah, this is kind of weird of a storyline. And like, oh yeah, the spider god takes on the two goblins. Though no one shows up later on as the gold goblin. Yeah, shows the gold goblin. No, he's not the only one who shows up here. Oh no, what gets that? So, we deal with that, and of course, no one basically just says he's not talking. Oz will reach out. We'll reach out to a legal team. He's ready to give statement. It's you. You, you sure you we better if New York police department and our legal team stay friendly. I hope it goes without saying that we're very expensive. <laughs> of course. So helps out, and apparently, get this. Then we have, we have apparently this under location where we have, apparently, looks like Roger Kingsley, like, they have leads there, we use, remembering your driving minds. And apparently, we lift this thing like we're in Star Wars for some reason, and he just sits down, puts a helmet over his head, and apparently, he's being manipulated by the Red Goblin Queen. Oh boy, there is an exclamation for this woman. This is Dr. Ashley Kafka. Yes, who is an actual clone. Yes, uh, apparently Wilson Fisk discovered her as alive in the Ravencroft miniseries and Mayor Power Ravencroft. And then for some reason, she got transferred from there over to the Beyond Corporation, she became Ben Riley's therapist, and she dared question. The Beyond Corporation about their motives related to Ben, and they turn to this. So Zed Wells is fought with something that kind of he was involved with. I'm much. I, I have to ask him again, like whose idea was it for the for turning Ashley Kafka into the Red Goblin Queen? And then 14 is all about Ben Riley. Well, as Kism. Yes, the whole point of this issue. Issue 14 is, it's a prelude to Dark Web. Yep. So, he has his girlfriend Janice just basically stabs somebody. 
E course preparing for something really big. Well, basically dark web. And then we have for some reason we have this story summer. And this is I believe it's uh Kahotsu in the artwork. Uh the way he draws supposedly I think it's supposed to be Peter. The way he draws him, he looks like John Constantine. I'm not kidding about that. He looks like John Constantine with that face. It's like, that much up, Peter Parker. Huh. No, you got the wrong guy. Don't try to do it with me. I'm talking about it. Then give up on me, buddy. You won't believe what I see mirrors these days. I've been calling Mr. Parker. I asked you to hold up. No one knew. You didn't make your sweet lie, did you? I don't have an aunt. Not anymore. I'm leaving now. Where are you going to be? We want our money, Parker. I'm sure to tell him. Yeah, that was actually his bed. Yep. And then apparently we have Kyle Holtz drawing Madeline Pryor, who for some reason uh, decided to give Madeline Pryor, who was the Goblin Queen, a six pack. Yes. Gave the smoking hot Madeline Pryor, who was a clone of Jean Grey and the mother of Cable, a six pack. I guess he felt this though. Why not? Why not give Madeline Pryor a six pack? By the way, she, she's not chubby at all. She's a muscular, but she's never really been depicted with a six pack before. She's usually been like, depicted like, pretty thin, but not to the point where she's ripped. Yeah, that is a six pack. Yes, that is what Kyle Holtz gave her a six pack. So. Basically, we're just building up the dark web. That's most of what the story is, Summer. And then we have the, the section where, where Janice is... Uh, where she's talking to the Goblin Queen. And she, she basically comes on mask and becomes... Hollow's Eve! Who's got a miniseries now. Yep. And of course, it's up more so with the fake Peter. But here's the thing. He may look like Peter, but he isn't. Did these guys not recognize the fact that Peter is a brunette and Ben is a blonde? How can you how can you basically screw this up? It, you, by the way, this guy is supposed to be a debt collector. Yes, a debt collector. And this guy mistakes Ben for Peter. Just because he's got the same face. Just by the fact they have different hair. Like, hello, dear. And just basically lots of build-up. Now, this is a completely different artist. Like... Okay, here's how this artist draws uh, Madeline Pryor. Here she's drawn somewhat normally. Very thin, beautiful. Uh, Kyle gave her a six-pack. No idea why. And next up is Dark Web. Um, I do like some of the issues in here. I like the AXE Judgment Day issue. Where it basically... Yeah, I don't like how the air characters were. I do, I do like the whole Judgment on Peter thing. Though it doesn't go anywhere. But it's a really interesting idea for a story. Um... Nine in a nutshell is an okay issue. I like the best thing about this issue is the artwork and seeing Wolverine in the issue. Um, Eleven to thirteen, I think that's that's probably the best storyline of this entire issue. Yes, uh, writing wise, I like the story. The major weakness of the storyline is the artwork. Not a fan of John Mia Jr. I don't hate his artwork. It just I'm not a fan. And fourteen. Uh, the biggest thing I like about this issue is the artwork. I love all the artwork and all the issues. And yes, it's a prelude to Dark Web, but it's good. It's really good. Though, I probably have to ask how host this when I see him again. Why the heck did you give Madeline Pryor... By the way, I get this book in 9 out of 10. Why the heck did you give Madeline Pryor a six-pack? <laughs> I thought that was kind of weird, but that is what it is. Yep. So yeah, that's it particular view. Uh, next up is going to be Is the Roger Girls Dungeon. Okay, next video. Bye.